So in this video we're talking about simple mixtures. Simple mixtures are binary mixtures and that means that they're just simply made up of two components. And we like the word mixture because it includes components that do dissolve in one another, um, are miscible, and so therefore form single phase systems that are called solutions. But remember that all solutions are mixtures, but of course not all mixtures are solutions because mixtures can be homogeneous or heterogeneous. So simple mixtures also implies that the two components, in this case two, because we'll limit ourselves to binary systems, um, the two components, they're not going to react with each other, and that makes sense, right? Because if they reacted with each other, then they would form, well, bonds would break and other bonds would, would be created between the atoms in different arrangements. And so there's, there would be a very um, significant change in composition if they reacted with each other. So. Um, and, and that might actually create different phases and a number of different components. So it's a little more complex and it's typically dealt with in another chapter. So on our way there, we are just looking at simple mixtures. So these are binary and they don't react with each other. And normally the kind of system that we look at initially usually involves gases because they're the kind of things that don't react with each other. Um, and don't even see each other, don't even have intermolecular forces, or forces even between um, atomic gas particles. But in this case, um, we're actually going to consider liquid systems and gas systems. So uh, let's have a look at the page in front of us here. So for comparison, when we are talking about um, a pure system, say like argon gas or liquid water or maybe even um, a benzene solvent, we have the properties of that system that are temperature, uh, pressure, another physical property would be the volume of that system, and then the number of moles, and it would be just N because um, I'm looking at a pure system, so there's only one thing in it and it would have an internal energy, it has, it's characterized by um, an enthalpy, uh, a free energy, Helmholtz free energy, a Gibbs free energy, um, if it's a gas it might have an internal pressure, um, it could have a thermal expansion coefficient that's significant, so, um, we could add to this list density as a physical property and so on. Um, and the Gibbs right here, the G would be you know, a molar Gibbs. So then when we think about a mixture, these simple mixtures, um, I'm still going to characterize that system with, with T, temperature, but I wouldn't say you know, say there's two components in this mixture, A and B. I'm not going to write T of A and T of B and then simply T for the mixture because of course they all have the same temperature. There's one temperature for the um, system. N without a subscript would denote the total number of moles for this binary system made of the number of moles of A plus the number of moles of B. And if my system is, um, well, it could be two liquids that have a vapor pressure above them, or it could be two gases. So in either case, I would have a mixture of gases either as my system or above my liquid system contributing to the system in that way as a, as a second phase. Um, in any event, with a simple mixture, I have a total pressure P, notice it doesn't have a subscript further, and I would have what are called partial pressures. And the volume, without further description, um, would be 
don't look at what's written here. The volume would be the, the total volume. And I also have to consider a partial molar um, volume, partial molar quantity. So I'll write it down here. I would have a VA, which is the partial molar volume of A, and a VB in this case, so the partial molar volume of B. Um, so let's think about what those are. I'll just switch up the page here. Okay, so to introduce the concept, um, we imagine our system here. We have our two components in our simple mixture, and they are liquid A and liquid B. The total volume in my system is V, V without further subscript. Great. Um, but that total volume is made up of both A and B, and so I can think of the volume contribution of A as being the partial volume, and the partial volume, not the partial molar volume, right? But the contribution to the total uh, due to A is just the partial volume. That kind of like a partial pressure. In fact, exactly like a partial pressure. Um, it would be that part of the volume that's contributed to A, and I would have the same thing for B. And so the total volume would be um, the, the partial molar volume of A times the number of moles of A. So this is really the volume per mole that A would occupy in a system of that concentration times the number of moles, and that makes my units work out so that I end up with units of volume. And the same thing for B. And so I introduced this new quantity, a partial molar quantity. It's really, um, looks like a little partial rate. So I symbolize it this way, and it's equal to the change in the total volume when an amount of A is added. And specifically, um, you can think of our beaker of solution and the change in the total volume that's experienced when I add one mole of A to a solution of that concentration while keeping the pressure, the temperature, and the other, num the other number of moles constant. That is my partial molar volume. So, it's, as it's written, it's the change in, mo in volume per mole of A when a volume of A is added to the solution. And so the text gives, most texts give the same example. Um, sorry for the scribble. <laughs> if I have a beaker here of pure water, pure water, pure substance, not a mixture, and I add one mole so, and one mole of, of water to the solution, What's the volume of one mole of water? Well, it's about 18 mils because the density is one gram per mil, and the molar mass is about 18 grams per mole. So the volume changes by 18 milliliters because I've added about 18 mils to it. So because it's a pure substance, the volume is going to change exactly by the volume that I add because I'm adding water to water. But if I'm adding water to ethanol, the volume is observed to change only by 14 milliliters, even though I'm adding 18 milliliters of water, but I'm adding it to a beaker of ethanol now instead of a beaker of water. It's, it's kind of neat. And actually, the if you were to feel the beaker, it would get warm. And um, we should do that, actually. It's a good little observation. Um, yeah, so that's our, our uh, expression 
not really a formula because I don't plug into something like that, but this is kind of a definition really for a molar volume of A in solution. In a solution of A and B. So you'll see in some textbooks that um, they use small i and small j. Um, but because our simple mixtures are always going to be binary, um, I just use A and B and so you'll see it'll look a little comp more complicated because this would be N with an I, N sub I, and constant would be T, P, and then N sub J, where J does not equal I. Yeah, and if you think about that for a minute, it does make sense. But it allows for non-reacting systems that have multiple components, um, and we're just considering binary. So we'll stick with A and B. And so what does it say? The partial molar volume of A depends on the composition of solution. Yeah, that's actually kind of, um, it's actually the neatest part of this, really. Because say you had ethanol and water, we can stick with that. Um, and you need to find out what's the partial molar volume of water in the solution. So you might be inclined to, um, look at a data table and say, okay, what's the partial molar volume of water in, and I'm just going to look up water at this particular temperature and pressure and with this other component, B. But instead of finding one value, you're going to find a whole plot of values because the volume that A takes up in a solution of A and B actually depends on the concentration of the solution. And so as soon as you add more A to it, you've changed the composition, and so now you have yet a new value of partial molar volume. Let's have a closer look. So why? Well, because the composition really determines the environment around the A molecule, and therefore the forces acting on A. So if I look at A, in just a beaker of, of pure liquid A, well, it's only experiencing AA forces. And it's in the bulk. So it's not at the surface. So it's being pulled everywhere. And um, if I look at A in a solution of AB, I can see that I've got, and, and in this solution of, of A and B, or I should say mixture of A and B, I have it's a it's rich in a so i would say the concentration of b is relatively lower than a because i have a a interactions and i have a few a b interactions okay so that means then that the volume of a that the volume that a would occupy or a mole of a would occupy in this would be different than here, and it it is purely because of intermolecular intermolecular forces. So maybe A and B have a very strong affinity for each other, but then maybe the opposite is true, and so that's going to change the volume. Um, now, and I think that says that right there. So just look at these two liquids. So you see the top one is rather rich in A, and this one by comparison is rather rich in B. So that's what I mean about whoops, my car. That's what I mean about um, finding the molar volume of of A or of B in a solution of A and B. It's not a single variable that you can look up in a table, and what you're going to find instead is a whole table just based on. A and B, mixtures of A and B. Okay, so the take home message here is that the partial molar volume of either A or B actually depends on the concentration of the solution. And so to dig deeper uh, molecular rationale here, it's because the volume that the component uh, needs to exist in that environment really depends on the net 
intermolecular forces among these uh, particles at that concentration. And so the partial molar volume will vary. So let's have a look at how it varies. There's a lot on this slide, but let's just look at this top graph for a minute. And maybe it relates to something that you've done as an experiment. Maybe. Um, so remember the expression for it. It was dV by DNA. So there's my y dV by DNA, which is on my x. And so I see that as I add more A to this solution, my total volume is increasing. Not a surprise. And it's increasing at kind of a consistent rate. Then it does something funny when it reaches this concentration, represented by this number of moles. And I guess at that concentration, if I add more A, the total volume doesn't even change. And if I add even more, the total volume actually decreases. So I get some volume shrinkage. And so basically what that means, if you think of what was written on the last slide with my A and B molecules, I've changed the local environment around A significantly enough that now A and B probably have quite an affinity for each other and I've reached a sort of a critical number of particles and they're contracting, the volume is contracting around them. And then that levels off. And so these are very strange looking functions and I can't really predict them. Um, these are purely empirical. And so remember what's on the y-axis is the total volume. So again, I could do this experiment and plot all of the points measuring the total volume as I add more and more and more and more A, keeping the number of moles of B constant. And if I took the slope of the tangent um, at any point, I would have uh, the slope value would be equal to dV by dNA at constant temperature pressure and number of moles of V, and therefore the value of the slope is the partial molar volume of A at that concentration of solution. And here's the partial molar volume at this concentration, and you see partial molar volumes can actually be negative because my slope would be negative there. So imagine I took the slope of the tangent at this point, and the next one, the next one, the next one, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on, and I took all that data, and then I plotted it over here in this graph. So in this graph, I'm representing composition a little bit differently with a unitless um, decimal zero, between 0 and 1, and I have a specific example of ethanol and water, and you want to be able to explain that. Of course, those effects are um, opposing. They're very complementary graphs. And so the, okay, when I don't have ethanol, the mole fraction is zero. Great, so up here, <laughs> sorry for that pause. Um, and so the dot on the y-axis here would be the partial molar uh, sorry, the pure molar volume of water. And this point over here, so on this graph I'm using two different y-axes. Um, when the mole fraction of ethanol is 1, I don't have any water, and that's my pure molar volume, or molar volume of pure ethanol, 58 milliliters per mole versus 18. When I mix them together, this is what happens. So when I mix them together, um, initially I get a little positive and then negative and so on. So again, if I were to plot all of the slopes here against number of moles, say, of water, that would give me data for the red point. So every slope would actually be the y value, right? Because the partial molar volume is the slope at this concentration, whatever it is. And so that slope value is now my y value on this plot for that concentration that is being represented by a mole fraction. Let's get back to some numbers. 
So I see that the volume, I'm just going to do this slide with you. Okay, I'm just follow along line by line. I see that the volume, the total volume, is a function of pressure, temperature, and the number of moles of each component. So under a constant temperature and pressure, like working on the bench, if I add some A and B to the solution, I'll get a change in the total volume. My convenient path is to handle it one at a time. And so I don't have T and P outside of the bracket here because I've said pressure and temperature are constant in this context. And so the total volume is going to change when I add a little bit of A by that, uh, according to the rate of change, which is the partial molar volume of A, and same for B. And um, see how my units will cancel, and I'm actually adding volume to volume and equaling volume. And I've just defined earlier that the change in the total volume with the addition of Na keeping uh, NV constant is my partial molar volume of A. So the total volume is PMV of A times DNA plus the PMV of B times DNB. And if I integrate both of these, I get then that the total delta V, um, and if I consider what are my limits, I would go unmixed to mixed. So final minus initial would be mixed minus unmixed. And in doing that, my delta V is then the delta V of mixing. It's really the delta V of mixing. But because I'm going from unmixed to mixed, I don't actually write a delta V of mixing. I just say, well, <laughs> it's, it is the volume of solution. Think about it. It's the volume of the mixture. If, my, if I just integrated from unmixed to mixed, what is delta V? It is the volume of the mixture. So when you're reading this in the book, you might think, OK, that was fine, and that was fine, and then we integrated, and I got that. But how can they say delta V is equal to V? And it's because you've gone from initial unmixed to final mixed. And so really, the change is the total volume of the solution. And it's equal to VANA plus VBNB. OK, because you integrated from here. Um, and really, this is, um, this is the solution that you would use in any numerical problem. So you would either, you would have one equation and therefore one, one unknown. And typically we know um, a volume and a density so we can figure out the number of moles. And they're not unknown liquids. And then we have the PMV of one and maybe of the other and so we have to find the total volume that we expect or we know the total volume and one of these is unknown. So it's pretty straightforward. So I can have partial molar quantities that um, are partial molar volumes. I can also have a partial molar quantity of, of any extensive property of the mixture, including Gibbs. And uh, that's one that we'll do next, and we'll do its own video.